This was one police detective who knew his trade inside and out. His career began in prison, in the company of the country's most hardened criminals. He escaped from some of the most fortified prisons in France. This ex-convict, a master of disguise, then changed himself into a Paris police officer, armed with the motto, to catch a thief, you've got to be one. Vidoc laid the foundation for a modern detective system in France. Eugene Francoise Vidoc was history's first super sleuth, a larger than life 19th century man, some say was the model for Sherlock Holmes. Though scorned by historians and never accepted by his fellow lawmen, the infamous Vidoc left an indelible mark on modern crime fighting and is now remembered as the first detective. February 25th, 1957. Atop a pile of trash on a lonely country lane in rural Philadelphia, a college student opens an abandoned department store box to find the body of a little boy stuffed inside. No parent claims the corpse. No clues are forthcoming, and a brutal killing goes unsolved. For more than four decades, this child's tragic death remains a mystery. Until one day in the fall of 1998, an elite band of investigators comes into the picture. These super sleuths have a single goal, to crack previously unsolved murders. At this very moment, this child is sitting and playing happily at the feet of Almighty God, and while he is unknown to us, he's on a first-name basis with every angel in heaven. They call themselves the Vidoc Society, after Eugène Francois Vidoc, the French detective and private eye who lived from 1775 to 1857. Who was this man Vidoc, and why, more than a century after his death, do the world's top forensic brains still fight crime in his name? 1775, France on the eve of revolution. While a lavish and decadent monarchy taxes the peasantry into starvation, the forces of bloody dissent are mounting. On the night of July 24th, the rumblings of distant thunder portend the violent time soon to come. In the market town of Arras, Eugène Francois Vidoc is born under these blustery skies. His father, a prominent baker, sees his new son as the heir to his family business. His mother dreams he will become a priest. But the midwife who delivers the baby accurately predicts a life as stormy as that same summer night. Vidoc was a juvenile delinquent. He started his career in crime as a 13-year-old uh, pain in the neck juvenile delinquent who ran a muck in his, in his town. Educated by Franciscan fathers, young Francois shows early evidence of a brilliant mind. But fencing interests him far more than fractions. The senior Vidocs adore their son, but can't seem to keep him under control. There was some thought that his parents were tough disciplinarians, but if that's so, they had every reason to be so because he was e extremely um, uh, violent uh, in his youth uh, and also given to bad company. Some less than savory character suggested that they rob the till of the family bakery, so they stole 2,000 francs from the bakery till and scampered off. With his ill-gotten cash in hand, the 14-year-old Francois plans to sail to America. He never makes it to the boat. After a drunken night with a prostitute, he awakens to find his clothes missing and his wallet empty. But bad luck doesn't quell his thirst for adventure. Approchez, approchez, mesdames et messieurs. Vidoc joins the circus playing a sideshow wild man who crunches pebbles with his teeth to amuse the crowd. 
The young man's Herculean build makes the act convincing, but the ringmaster beats his star as if he were a real beast and confines him to a cage. The director tells him, you have to act uh, like a monkey and to eat fresh meat, for example, a living chicken. Uh, of course, it was not so, so easy to do uh, for, for young Vidak, and he decided to uh, go away and to try another chance. So he went back home with his tail between his legs, as he often did, and was forgiven by his parents. So they can't have been as dreadful, perhaps, as some of the legends paint them. 1793, the reign of terror commences. Revolutionary leaders find decadent King Louis XVI guilty of betraying his country and condemn him to death. His wife, Marie Antoinette, soon follows. Having wet their lips with aristocratic blood, rebel mobs become intoxicated, embarking on a year-long bloody bender. In Paris, those born to privilege are labeled traitors and imprisoned. In one six-week period, the people's bloody equalizer, the guillotine, claims 1,400 lives in Paris alone. In Vidocq's hometown of Arras, people lose their heads over any seeming disloyalty to the cause. Still, the bold Francois doesn't shy away from trouble, even risking his own neck. He intervenes when the mob targets his former teachers, the Franciscan fathers. Then he tries to stop noble women from being put to death simply for their titles. Vidocq's heroics land him in jail for obstructing justice, a crime punishable by death. The young man's parents plead in vain for his life. Suddenly, a young woman who has adored Vidocq since childhood steps in. Louise Chevalier uses her family's influence to have her lover freed. Three months later, Louise announces she is pregnant and her outraged father prepares to sharpen the blade once more. Given the choice between betrothal or beheading, Vidocq takes his first of three wives. Not long after their shotgun wedding, Vidocq learns that Louise lied about the pregnancy. The furious bridegroom bolts, vowing that never again will anyone force him to conform. Only 18 years old, he sets off again, drawn like a magnet towards trouble and danger. He was a very inveterate brawler and dueler, and very often the brawls and duels were not unrelated to his other great interest in life women. It was the combination of his, his uh, fighting instinct and his romantic proclivities that led him to be jailed around 1796 uh, for a uh, quarrel over a woman. In prison for the first time, Vidocq's path takes an unexpected turn. He is accused of forging the discharge documents of a farmer who had stolen a bit of wheat to feed his hungry children. It is soon discovered that the papers are false. The prison warden accuses Vidoc. His whole life, Vidoc will try to clear himself of this accusation, saying, I didn't do it, somebody else in prison did it. Did Vidoc show compassion for the hungry farmer and forge the document, or was he simply framed? The answer remains a mystery. But this seemingly insignificant event will forever change the young man's life and the course of police history. Convicted of forgery, he is sentenced to eight years hard labor at Brest, one of France's most dreaded prisons. He talks about Brest as he first sees it as a place of miseries. He says that his soul was penetrated by an unsuppressible horror when he looked around, and he decided he wasn't going to stay there very long. In 1799, after just a few weeks at Brest, Vidoc concocts a plan. He swallows tobacco juice to induce a fever and is admitted to the prison hospital. There, he seeks to disguise himself in women's clothing, but all the women are too small. 
So he thinks again, and suddenly he, his eye, his practiced eye, falls on a beautiful and rather passionate nun who, had, who was serving as a prison nurse and had had romances with uh, both guards and orderly. She had quite a reputation. Uh, I think her name was Sister Francoise. And under circumstances that are a little bit vague but sound to me romantic, the idea came to me to borrow her clothes. Vidoc would later write, In brief, about 2 a.m., I hastily donned her clothes. In this nun's habit, I scaled the hospital wall, and there I was, in the middle of the countryside. Still wearing his nun's habit, Vidoc befriends a priest who invites him to mass. The escapee mimics the genuflection of the father's maid, and his secret remains safe for the moment. For the next decade, this ex-con is a ne'er-do-well chameleon, arrested and rearrested, always escaping, leaving a myriad of identities in his wake. Vidoc was very innovative in escapes. He escaped from some of the most fortified prisons in France, La Force Prison. He escaped from the galleys, where only the toughest, most hardened criminals were chained to, literally to oars. And, and he escaped. Finally, weary of running, the fugitive starts life over again in Paris in 1809. Using an alias, he opens a dry goods store with his ever-forgiving mother and his favorite mistress, Annette. For eight months, the business prospers. Then, just when it looks as if trouble is behind him, some ex-convicts recognize Vidoc and attempt to extort money. In response, Vidoc hatches his most daring plan yet. After a decade on the lam, Eugène Francois Vidoc, country boy turned fugitive, stands to lose his new life as an honest storekeeper after ex convicts threaten to expose his past crimes. Vidoc formulates a possible way out, but it poses enormous risk. Instead of fleeing again, he decides to seek aid from his enemy, the police, not to beg for mercy, but to strike a bargain. He goes to see a Monsieur Henri, who occupies an important position with the French police, and Vidoc makes a suggestion that surprises him and says, during all these years on the run, I've mingled with all kinds of criminals, thieves. I know pretty much everybody. Through these underworld connections, Vidoc brags that he can solve the crimes that have so far stumped the police. Vidoc offers himself as a prison spy. Living behind bars, he promises to secretly unravel the plots of France's most notorious criminals. At first, Monsieur Henri refuses, but later accepts. Vidoc's career will take off and progress with lightning speed because he uncovers countless criminals. The police are stupefied because at the time they were quite ineffective, and all of a sudden, Vidoc is being very successful. Turning on his fellow convicts doesn't trouble him in the least. For nearly two years, Vidoc thwarts numerous robberies, even aiding in the capture of entire gangs of crooks. One day, as he's led away in chains to an awaiting coach, Vidoc escapes. Fellow inmates have no idea that Vidoc's disappearance has been staged and that he is about to begin life again, working as a secret agent outside the prison walls. I frequented every house and street of ill fame sometimes under one disguise, sometimes under another, till the rogues and thieves whom I daily met there firmly believed me to be one of themselves. Success in his espionage activity fuels Vidoc's ego, leading him to ridicule the police and to lobby for a new type of crime-fighting force, one that is capable of waging a real war on crooks. Paris officials reluctantly create the Brigade de la Sûreté, or Security Brigade. The crafty detective receives the title of chief, but no officers serve under him. They gave 
Vidoc, his own headquarters, but it was never right within the precincts of the prefecture. So if anything went wrong, as indeed it did, they could always have deniability. Vidoc hires ex-convicts who are paid a bounty for each arrest. The chief's philosophy, to catch a thief, you've got to be one, becomes the mantra of the Sûreté. Unlike the police in uniform, the innovative lawman follows suspicious characters incognito. The skies was flair. He would walk around with multicolored scarves in different pockets, and he'd walk down, he'd follow you, and he'd change his scarf. You know, so somebody was being, he turned around, there was a guy with a white scarf, now he's wearing a red scarf. He changed his clothes. A master of disguise, Vidoc changes identity at will, even fooling criminals who know him well. He is authentic down to the skin. When he poses as a construction hand, his costume includes cheap underwear. His impersonation of a woman is so authentic, he must fend off the attentions of would-be suitors. His friend, the novelist Honoré de Balzac, begs Vidoc to reveal the secret of his success. The detective replies that disguise is not an art, but a science. Observe what you would become, then act accordingly, and you will be transformed. Vidoc's enormous ego prevents him from staying anonymous for very long. Every time he apprehends a criminal, he flings off his disguise, proclaiming, I am Vidoc. The genius of Vidoc is to immerse himself, to go deep into the underground layers of society, to have ears everywhere, to resemble that which he is fighting, to become some kind of a double, giving criminals the feeling that he is always on their backs, at their side, their accomplice. In 1817, with only a dozen full-time assistants, Vidoc's crew makes 800 arrests. He quickly becomes a local celebrity, wearing cloaks lined in silk and white calfskin gloves, dining in the finest restaurants and courting beautiful women. The common people adore the chameleon's theatrics, but the police abhor them. He would tweak the nose of the other police officers. He wasn't very well liked by other uh, law enforcement because he was an ex-convict and he, he was sort of braggadocio and he was sort of flamboyant and uh, there was this natural uh, jealousy uh, against him. Police remind him that they have the power to return him to prison at any moment. As a former convict, he cannot vote or travel outside the country. In 1817, at the behest of influential friends and five years after being named chief, Vidoc finally receives a royal pardon from King Louis XVIII. Despite that pardon, a jealous police force keeps watch over the convict turned private eye, secretly plotting his downfall. In the elegant bedroom of a Parisian chateau, a glamorous young countess lies murdered on the floor, a bullet lodged in her forehead. Who could have killed her? Police have no clues, but suspect the woman's husband who happens to own a pair of dueling pistols. Protesting his innocence, the Count is arrested. The case falls to Eugène Francois Vidoc, chief of the Sûreté. Legend has it that he secretly hires a doctor to extract the bullet from the dead woman's forehead. In the early 19th century, only a fearless rebel like Vidoc would have dared defile the corpse of such a prominent individual. He then attempts to match the slug with the chamber of the Count's gun. He saw that the caliber was different and started looking elsewhere for the, for the uh, murderer. The slug fits the pistol owned by the dead woman's lover, who breaks down and confesses to the murder. If this tale is indeed more than apocryphal, then Vidoc is an early pioneer in the field of ballistics. He very strongly stressed a detection from physical clues. In my opinion, as a crime historian, uh, it seems to me that Vidoc laid the foundation for a modern detective system in France. 
He is a proven innovator in other areas of detective science. VDOG dabbles in fingerprints, blood testing, and plaster of Paris, making casts of prints left by a pair of hobnailed boots worn by a notorious burglar. The first to compile massive files on crooks, the master detective's dossiers include aliases, physical descriptions, prior convictions, and what police will later term modus operandi. He feels that the criminals and thieves tend to always repeat the same crimes or operate in the same manner. Therefore, by keeping records on everybody, it is easy to say this crime is signed. Only so-and-so could have committed this crime. Word of his achievements reaches England, where Sir Robert Peel seeks VDOC's advice in creating Scotland Yard. Many years later, the Federal Bureau of Investigation will model its criminal filing system after the Sûreté. During his lifetime, however, Vidoc's ingenuity is never appreciated by the French police. Not only was he an outsider coming into their territory, he was telling them their baby was ugly, that they'd been doing it all wrong. You know, what do you mean you never took a footprint? What do you mean you don't keep central records? Well, it doesn't take long for a person doing that to win some serious enemies. And that's what I think happened in the case of Viduck. The wily chief's flamboyance provides his enemies ample ammunition. He hires two chemists to develop unalterable bond paper and indelible ink, brilliant new weapons against prolific counterfeiters and forgers. Recognizing their lucrative potential, Vidoc takes out patents on his inventions and opens a small factory. But his rivals are enraged that he would dare use his crime-fighting innovations to try to line his own pockets. The police accuse him right away of trying to sell his famous non-falsifiable paper to banks who had been robbed spreading the rumor that he may have organized the robberies in order to sell his paper. The attempt to frame him fails when the police can't prove their case. Vidoc's ingenious discoveries contribute to his wealth and become breakthroughs in modern crime fighting. The audacious sleuth further defies convention by showing sympathy for the criminals he pursues. The most famous case of the detective's great compassion occurs during his stakeout of a thief named Sablin. Once he has tracked his quarry, Vidoc bursts into the hideout of Sablin and his wife. Vidoc, with all of his muscular ability, flies on top of this man and handcuffs him, whereupon this poor lady collapses in a chair and starts groaning very deeply. And he says to Sablin, what's the matter with her? And Sablan must have thought, what's become of your vaunted powers of observation? She's in the last hours of pregnancy. In fact, she was rushing off to get the midwife when you burst in the front door. And Vidoc takes off his jacket, rolls up his sleeves, and in 25 minutes or thereabouts, he helps deliver a fine boy. And to show that uh, there were no hard feelings for this, sudden arrest, the proud mother asks Vidoc to serve as godfather. Vidoc's adventures make him seem almost superhuman, and perhaps he believes that he can best anyone, even a king. In 1824, the paranoid Charles X ascends the throne and orders officers to devote themselves to hunting down traitors. Vidoc refuses, eventually making a surprising decision. He resigns. The time has come for the master of disguise to reinvent himself again. He starts a cardboard factory in Saint-Monde, which is just outside Paris, and again, as with his surete, hires only former convicts who wish to reclaim their place in society. He is an advocate of rehabilitation. He is totally opposed to a repressive police and a stark believer in giving people a second chance. Vidoc opens his progressive factory in 1827. 
That same year, his highly exaggerated memoirs are published. The book becomes a bestseller, not only in his native France, but also around the world. One fan is Edgar Allan Poe, who, with Vidocq as his model, writes the world's first detective story called Murders in the Rue Morgue in 1842. Vidocq also shares his saga of wrongful imprisonment and police harassment with his good friend, the author Victor Hugo. Hugo was a great humanitarian, a great critic of uh, French justice, and this life's story uh, strongly affected him. Hugo will ultimately pen Les Miserables, the saga of Jean Valjean who steals a loaf of bread out of hunger, then escapes prison in disguise, only to be hounded by police for the rest of his life. Like his fictional counterpart, Vidoc too is a man for whom adversity breeds compassion. One of the most famous scenes from Les Miserables is the scene where a cart overturns and the driver is pinned beneath the wheel. Everyone despairs and suddenly a titan of a man appears on the scene. It is Jean Valjean in, in disguise. He adroitly lifts the wheel. Uh, saves the man's life. The scene is lifted directly from an incident in Vidoc's life. The cart comes from Vidoc's paper factory, and the man trapped beneath is one of Vidoc's employees, an ex-convict. It was Vidoc who lifted the cartwheel, saved him, and then, by the way, uh, prevented him from being sent off to a pauper's hospital, saw that instead he was sent to a first-class Paris hospital and paid all the bills. Vidocq's compassion towards criminals is not shared by his fellow merchants, and in 1830, his cardboard box factory collapses. But the brazen entrepreneur has another scheme in mind, a shrewd business proposition that will pit him against his lifelong adversaries, the French police. Middle-aged and unemployed in 1832, Francois Vidocq is certain of two things, that fame suits him and that time has not tamed his thirst for the hunt. Again, Vidocq flings off his cape to reveal another identity. At age 59, seeing no reason why sleuthing should remain the exclusive domain of the police, Vidocq opens the world's first private detective agency called the Bureau des Rensonnements, or Inquiries Office. Once again, he hires former criminals who steadfastly demonstrate their loyalty. Vidoc's staff, at one point numbering 60, specializes in tracking down and busting swindlers. You gotta remember, in those days, fraud was rampant, counterfeiting was rampant. There were gangs, street gangs, there were charlatans and con men all over the place. And he filled that niche to help people that, that just the police were overwhelmed, just as the private investigators do today. Vidocq's bureau will become the prototype of modern detective agencies, and his character, inspiration for the world's best-loved fictional sleuth created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in 1887. Sherlock Holmes referred to himself as the world's first consulting detective, but we have to recall that Vidocq himself uh, blazed the trail uh, for uh, Europe uh, in creating a private detective agency. So Vidoc precedes Sherlock Holmes by a long shot in serving as a private eye. One of the th real things that drove the French police crazy when he started his private detective agency, now they have competition. They never had private competition to solve cases and they went to Great Lamps trying to put him out of business. Police ransack Vidocq's office, even ripping his name off the door. Ultimately, they arrest him on the trumped up charges of a swindler. The former chief, so fond of graceful living, finds himself once again behind the bars of a dank, squalid prison. By the time he enters the courtroom, nine months after his arrest, charges have mounted and Vidoc's entire career is on trial. The judge of the police court sentences him to five years for false imprisonment and for taking money from clients under false pretenses. 
demande, il fait appel, et c'est là qu'il y a le grand procès. He appeals, and there is a big trial where the generosity of Vidoc is revealed. Theater producers testify that their theaters have been operating for many years thanks to Vidoc's financial contribution. Then came all kinds of people who he had also helped financially. This trial is amazing because people from all social classes show up to testify on his behalf. Vidoc's loyal supporters unite and his conviction is overturned. Still, the battle rages on. When Vidoc is 68 years old, police take him down once more. Like Jean Valjean in Les Miserables, Vidoc has never been forgiven for his first petty crime. Now, his 45-year-old forgery conviction for assisting a hungry farmer has come back to haunt him again. Even though he was pardoned by King Louis XVIII, he was ultimately told by the police that he must leave the city because he was an ex-convict. So that really, well up until the last decade of his life, Vidoc was still being treated, despite his services to France, as a jailbird. The chief prosecutor intervenes, and the order to ban the detective from Paris is rescinded. But Vidoc has lavished his fortune on legal fees. Clients remain suspicious. Business drops off. No longer prosperous, Vidoc closes his detective agency after 11 years. If I am to believe those who do not know me, I am a freak, an anomaly, a fairy tale giant in everything and anything imaginable, no matter how vile, disgusting, or contrary to the very elements of human nature it might be. Still, the Vidoc legend continues to grow. On May 16, 1846, the London Sun reports that Vidoc has died near Brussels in a state of poverty. A few weeks later, the Sun prints a rebuttal to the obituary written by Vidoc himself. I trust you will be kind enough to contradict such a false statement, as I am neither dead nor poor. Even in his final decade, Vidoc still craves the adulation and excitement that catching criminals has always brought him. He deluges the police with reports, detailing swindles and conspiracies, but is snubbed even by clerks. Despite a lifetime of attacks on his character and career, nothing truly torments Vidoc as much as being ignored. On his deathbed, he is reputed to have said, I could have been a field marshal of France, but there were two things I loved too much, women and dueling. Before Vidoc's body could be removed from his apartment, Paris police arrived to confiscate his remaining records. The detective's burial is so humble, some historians believe Vidoc died impoverished. One book states that even at age 82, his death is more from hunger than old age and yet he left a substantial donation to the poor. Did Vidoc arrange a cheap funeral in order to bid farewell with one last mystery? Quite literally, the old lion carried that secret to the grave. He was a lion in his winter. He had the shaggy locks of a lion, and he had the residual strength of his youth. His death was sadder than most because it seemed almost impossible having escaped all of the dangers of his life that he would finally succumb to death because he seemed uh, literally immortal. Even death didn't diminish the French authorities' attempts to discredit Eugène Francois Vidoc, a man who revolutionized both crime fighting and the rehabilitation of criminals. Their campaign against him was so successful, his name remains absent from most official records. He is seldom mentioned in history books, maybe because he remained very mysterious and that we never really knew how to explain him. He is so ambiguous that until now, historians preferred avoiding him. Even reference books disregard him. 
The National Police Encyclopedia, published in Paris after World War II, places the founding of the world-famous Sûreté, the French equivalent of Scotland Yard, after Vidocq's retirement, stating that the detective headed only a semi-informal group of investigators and informers. The result of hiring former criminals was that he could fulfill that slogan that we know so well, it takes a thief to catch a thief. And that was very much his belief. But it left him with a cloud of suspicion. In Vidocq's hometown of Arras, France, those who revere the world's first private eye want to cleanse the stain from his name. The mayor and the official people, even the books, they never tell a word about Vidocq. Why? Why? It seems to be a very fascinating character. We have not even a street with the name of Vidocq. Funny, crazy. So I thought something had to be done. Sylvain Vézé directs Le Studio, a troupe of actors in Arras which brings the private eye to life for tourists. Vidocq's remaining cousins are among the performers. For the elders, it was a disgrace to talk about Vidocq because we knew he had been a thief. Today we are no longer against him because he became somebody. He became chief of police, and then he started a business, and before he died, he gave whatever money he had left to charity. So I think he redeemed himself. Vidocq has triumphed from the grave in the United States as well, having become the namesake of an international band of ace sleuths, the Vidocq Society. The brainchild of William Fleischer, a former FBI agent and polygraph expert in Philadelphia, the society was founded in 1990 when a group of the country's top forensic experts met for lunch and began hashing over old unsolved murders. I said, we ought to do this on a regular basis. I'm considering getting a group of people together, and let's look at old cases. It could be 30 years old, it could be 50 years old, it could be 100 years old, it could be 5 years old, and we will uh, see if we can solve them in light of uh, what we know in modern forensics and psychology and behavior. With more unsolved murders in the United States each year, this eminent think tank fills a void in police work, just as its namesake did 150 years before. The VDOC Society won't step in until a case has grown cold, and then only at the behest of a victim's family or law enforcement. Offbeat bylaws limit membership to 82, one detective for every year that VDOC lived, all of whom offer their services for free. One of my missions when I first started the VDOC Society was to get people to know what a great man this was. This man can be a model for every juvenile delinquent that wants to turn his life around and do good. Like VDOC, the Society never stops looking for the truth. Members have assisted on over 100 cases and cracked several previously unsolvable homicides. In one case, Eight years after a murdered university student was found fully clothed except for shoes and socks, the VDOC Society helped secure the arrest of a former security guard with a foot fetish. The boy in the box is their most baffling murder case to date, a four-decade-old mystery with a cold trail and few clues. In 1957, a photograph of a murdered little boy found on a trash heap blanketed Philadelphia. Even the gas company mailed pictures of his lifeless face with a monthly bill. No one came forward then, which is why the VDOC Society has vowed to give that boy a name now. We were brought up to believe it, yeah. People looked out for children. If you were lost, uh, you know, people helped you cross the street. And here's a little boy battered, abused, found dead. And it, it, it sort of shocked me. The group exhumed the boy's body and arranged a proper funeral. But first, like VDOC, members made use of the latest scientific tools, DNA testing, in their attempt to unlock this puzzling mystery. I feel comfortable that most cases are solvable. It's proving them. That is the hard part. 
Despite continued dead ends on this case and others, despite occasional rejection by police, Fleischer, like his organization's namesake, refuses to admit defeat. His strength is something that I admire. Strength is in your, your fortitude and your willingness to, to pursue leads and to stay up those extra hours and review that document again and again until you see something that you missed. So many times I've uh, pursued a case the way I would suspect Vidoc would pursue it. Francois Vidoc fueled the spirit of modern justice, but he also possessed a dark side that stained his reputation and blotted his name from the history books. This intriguing dichotomy has lit the imagination of some of the world's greatest writers. I regard his life as one of the great adventures of the 19th century. Without his life, without his adventure, there would be uh, no Edgar Allan Poe detective stories, there would be no Sherlock Holmes, there would be no Les Miserables to enjoy. He is a serious police detective. He is a rogue. He is a womanizer. He is a writer. He has inspired great literature, and he has stimulated the popular imagination. And for all of those accomplishments, I owe him great respect. I am Vidoc. Vidoc was born under stormy skies, and he lived that way. He survived revolution, prison, and a legion of enemies, all determined to crush his spirit. A weaker man may have folded, but not Vidoc. A man who, with the soul of a hero, survived to make a difference in history.